Hello all, and now I want to introduce the second volume of the ever-present origin with Gene Gebser. And of course, if you are not familiar with the ever-present origin and how it's structured, the first volume is of course on the foundations of you know, following his, hist his historical accounts with this formalized and deferring structures that of course are mutating and ever present as the title suggests. Now of course when we are talking of the integral which he does in volume two then you will know that one of the great characteristics of it and its innovations is the introduction or the eruption of time as chapter one starts off with. And so the integral structure, or at least this European phenomenon within uh, the realm of physics, and especially this is the case with Einstein, however, we would have to go even further before that to the 19th century, which of course is known for the generation of thermodynamics. And so perhaps we would consider how Maxwell's demon, which famously introduces entropy where of course prior to this in the perspectival age or the rational age you had with newtonian physics and newtonian physics were the processes of moving bodies in space and this of course was mapped with calculus but it, this didn't factor in entropy and so you know what is this in its introductory form and of course if we were going to look at the metaphysical principle within Max's demon example. Then you have the introduction of hot particles that move, of course, faster than the colder, slower ones, and eventually they converge in a box. But of course, gradually the hot randomizes as it you know, mixes with the slower ones, and thus you create the conditions for a thermodynamic equilibrium. But of course, within this example, you cannot reenact such a system uh, with just the factoring of space and calculus. You, uh, in entropy, you cannot have this same uh, occurrence unless you put in fresh new energy, in this case, hot particles into it. And so this is essentially time's arrow. And time's arrow is irreversible because as mentioned, Max's demon sits at the center of those two boxes and he's facilitating out the faster and slower particles. Theoretically, this would reverse entropy by reversing them back into the two boxes. And so this metaphysical principle, of course, is the foundation really for how you would end up with the steam engine and uh, the technical discoveries and uh, inventions to come out of that uh, century. But of course, as Gebser uh, talks about more here, Einstein in 1905 on electrodynamics of moving bodies or what can be derived from the paper on it when the body approaches the speed of light, the body collapses into a sort of 2D as time stops as it approaches the uh, light speed capacity. And so also gaining infinite mass, it is impossible for anyone with mass outside of photons, which of course are massless, to actually be at light speed. And so this is a shift, of course, for Gebser from the 3D infinite space or perspectival, and you're seeing the collapsing of those dimensions as time slows down and back into that mythical conscious structure of the 2D world. And of course, the relationship with time in the 2D world exists in that cyclical harvest mentality, and uh, such is the case with myth, where myth as... Marshall McLuhan would point out, it isn't a, a more complex world, but is actually a simplistic and a really active compacting in myth, a variance of all these different processes 
that unfold gradually. And so the mythic image, of course, in its nature to be, you know, told in the sort of stories of Achilles um, in uh, Homer. And this is going to be remembered. This is in its imagery, despite its collapsing, really, of the dimensions this is going to be remembered way more than just a bunch of facts or um, you know rational accounts of something like the Trojan War. And of course, the Trojan War, what does that really uh, mean insofar that it is most likely a compression of many different Trojan Wars throughout uh, that epoch? And so the myth, the image then, is used in that sort of way to express all of those different processes or historical events all uh, woven into one. And so the mythical individual is no more than the icon and you know, there's no real personalized uh, you know, individual that we would later see in the perspectival age. Uh, it, it's an icon that is flattened. But of course, as I mentioned in my last video, and other think other people have pointed out, you know, you see this reemergence really of the mythic in the electric culture we find ourselves in, where of course we're now at the communications of the speed of light, just as mentioned above with Einstein's electrodynamics. And so in a way we are collapsing into these mythic icons that, of course, radiate with cliches or a sort of platonic form of stereotypes from the uh, 2D mythical world that's in a way being retrieved here uh, in, in hypermodernity because, of course, of the uh, light speed capacity. So Einstein's retrieval of the magical with its Unitarian and uh, Gebser would say that this is the really the same as what would come with these 2D faces of platonic forms and uh, uh, really techniques to come. And so the construction of time itself becomes more slippery as time moves slower in uh, the findings of gravitational field of such as the case with you know clocks in space moving faster than clocks down on the you know, ground uh, level. And so in this capacity, time, of course, has a fluidity to it now because it's a function of mass and curvatures and bends, the space around interstellar objects or the planets becoming as well of a fluid of mass and speed more changeable. And so the eruption of time uh, is really the same for Gebser in his discoveries with Picasso as him finding the fourth dimension of time perspectival structure that sliced the world. And so when, you know, in the mental structure, we sliced away uh, and, and cut a single point of view out of space and time with cubism, with Picasso, you're seeing uh, the, uh, the Unitarian, if you'd like, of all of that cutting of, of one perspective being put back together with his uh, his art. And so we're seeing a return to the wholeness of the ever present. And just as you know, we're in a capable of a new mutation uh, that returns as the total in the integral as the all other structures from the ever present origin are made uh, disposable in a space free and time free world. So there is a bit of romanticism, of course, that Gebser has in uh, this volume of, you know, arts, of culture, of really escaping historicism, of escaping space and time and, and now being free of it to uh, bring about a new spirituality. Um, and so in that sort of way, despite, you know, his, uh, his, his reverence against something like, uh, you know, an evolution of these consciousness. Uh, nonetheless, in the integral, you could perhaps see here that, um, you know, we're, we're completing a sort of world picture uh, through this new opportunity of being able to see uh, 
and, and place rationality, uh, which is now deficient, of course, to one of a perspectivity. And uh, moving along then in part two, you have this, what he calls the new mutation and a lot of apocalyptic imagery to come as he announces uh, this new age here, which of course you didn't see in volume one. Um, and so essentially when these prior mutations falter below the dominant or efficient structure that we've talked about, they do not cease, of course, but they return to the depths to then reinvigorate in new images of what is that day's dominant threshold. So, you know, even though structures are uh, mutated away from, from their efficient causes, their vitality, whatever that new mutation that comes about uh, or dominates, still you will find, you know, images and reinvigoration of those prior structures uh, they don't simply cease to be, but they're, you know, unconsciously, uh, you know, underneath the depths, if you will, because they don't make that sort of threshold for, uh, you know, wider culture. Um, and so he's really announcing uh, a new age. And of course, uh, this will be quite influential for the later half of his century and into the 21st as well with... Um, you know, the moving away from an industrial to a spiritual civilization, whether it's uh, in the capacity of the acoustic uh, electric culture that McLuhan talks about, uh, or with uh, theosophy, you have someone such as Rudolf Steiner, who talks about the descending of the archangel Michael, where, you know, we're bringing about a new spiritual age. You can see a lot of comparisons here in uh, new Age thought uh, through the apocalypse of industrial and technical culture will bring about a sort of spiritual aspect in. And this is the case with Alan Watts. And of course, as we'll get into soon with Joseph Campbell and uh, his discussions of mythology um, and, 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 you know, really the 60s as a whole. You could see, uh, you know, starting out as a sort of, uh, you know, very highbrow, intellectual, highly cultured uh, people um, who notice these sort of limitations of rationality or are noticing the encompassing of, uh, you know, our direction away from being in that sort of Heideggerian sense uh, in the sort of relationship towards the ever-present origin, if you'd like, with Gebser, um, you know, it, it estrains, it's further away from that spiritual uh, or, or loss, if you would like, before it. But perhaps the same could be said, of course, in the end for the New Age movement, as, you know, you see high intellect being demonstrated with the likes of Campbell or an Alan Watts, to then descend really down to just pure emotionality of, you know, the self-help sort of, and, and really the explosion to then come in contemporary times of self-improvement in a mass democratic electric culture uh, where, you know, cliches run rampant and uh, this sort of bro advice that we always uh, sort of denigrate, if you would like, but to then go back to Gebser's thought, once a structure moves into this deficient epoch, the overlapping of a new structure emerging in its efficient state, um, and you know this transition period Gebser talks about is sort of a, a tuning away from one channel to the next. There's a sort of a static, a, a void, um, as a cosmology shifts into a new channel and so, of course, you have this state of, again, that apocalyptic imagery that wasn't seen really in volume one reigns through here where uh, you have German catastrophism really with Gebser in uh, a really real way where he points to the 19th century of the deficient rational to then the rising of a new a perspectival. When we talk about spheres and these cultural uh, bubbles, if you would like, that 
immunize a, a civilization or a people, we now really see uh, you know, a culture now in this sort of depth, this watery unknown in this miniature of a cavern-like structure. And when waking consciousness like miracles or telepathy uh, actually concretize themselves in the manifold of time and space, and, you know, to maybe brush up on this a little bit more in a more uh, accessible way, perhaps, in today's thought, we could look at how, you know, the evolution of, of really our 5 million year old body or, or how we're embodied, if you'd like, you know, has these different stages and, um, you know, in a very interesting way, perhaps we could see how um, those deficient modes, uh, as we've gone along physically, still rear uh, from that watery abyss. You see you know, many people in today's world struggling with the sort of anxiety disorders, this flight or flight response, despite the fact that they are, you know, perhaps in the most decadent time in history of, of safetyism, and yet they're, a, they're mentally a sort of mess, the sort of reptilian brain that's deep within us is, is quite alienated. And in that sense, I've always thought about that with how Gebser talks about the act of miracles. Uh, I, I associated, of course, in the past video about this, about the body without organs that Deleuze and Guattari talk about, perhaps interestingly enough, overlays with the idea of prayer here where you know Gebser takes very seriously the idea of by delving away from the ego sheath and, and dipping back down into the depths of, of these past structures of consciousness, we can actually um, you know rejuvenate them because they are of course uh, ever present. Um, and then he really discusses, uh, but I always uh, sort of add this on here because he really brings up how prophets and individuals, and this is important perhaps if you look at history as, as really the movement of certain individuals, the sort of historical big man, if you'd like, um, where you know inextricably there are individuals who face against uh, collectives or apparatuses, uh, religions, if you'd like, or uh, the, uh, the state apparatus, if you will, and you know they move beyond that context of authority of that past structure. They are ahead of the times, if you would like. And uh, uh, perhaps the example, really, with the myth of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, where um, you know you have this shift from the shamanic and the magical structure. This is for Gebser's model, really, the start of the uh, of civilization, really. Um, because of course in the magical structure the shaman was uh, really the vision quest uh, in the paleolithic but now of course we're seeing the rise of the priest of that relationship of the uh, divine law through the priest as a spokesman of the goddess of the neolithic and um, the god king such as gilgamesh of Uruk you must go on this quest of a spiritual reality. And so he leaves a rook to his single lone journey. Uh, but again, this is the sort of shamanic quest of that magical vision. And of course, by doing this, he's rewarded with uh, the quest with immortality and to become a judge really of the afterlife. In a way, of course, he achieves this because here I am right now talking of him. And, uh, Gilgamesh, in a literary sense, is significant towards that uh, revelation of the individual quest and the retrieval of the magical shamanic or enlightenment as seen with the rise of prophets and individuals in their spirituality, which is, of course, in that act, they are in a rejection of that official priesthood. Let's not forget in those prior structures before this, you know, religion and the state apparatus, they are interwoven into one. And, um, you know, by going off into an individual quest, a sort of magical vision, 
a shamanic experience, then, um, you, you know, you ultimately are undoing that sort of apparatus that was prior to it, or the official priesthood. And you can see this as a sort of precursor, really, of what's to come with Protestantism and, you know, the idea of the individual spiritual quest in the face of that state apparatus. And um, then perhaps we could look at how spheres uh, have a similar analogy to chakras in the Eastern world. Just as the nine celestial spheres or planets, the fixation and uh, astrology, of course, the science of those, the fixing of those stars uh, as seen in the West. But of course, each of those spheres, those planets had different archetypical properties, such as of course, with Mars and vitality with its red and of course, affirmation of war. And, you know, in the Eastern world, we could say with the yogi and the chakras, which of course ascend up the spine and into the mind. And, you know, in the West, of course, those archetypes were externalized. They were outer directed in their cosmological makeup of the planets. And, you know, this is a hallmark really of that externalization of Western thought of each of those celestial spheres and their properties. But of course, in the Eastern landscape, you have the chakras in their own archetypes, uh, but of course they're stored within. And um, there's an interesting contrast here to the Eastern and Western thought with spheres and, and chakras. Now, Gebser of course associates, and it's important to point out that the magical is usually associated, at least in his historical timelines, to the hunters and nomads and domesticators, where the mythic is farming and agriculture As of course the goddess brings about the fertilization of the soil and again uh, to go back to that time model aspect you know the mythic of course with this association with farming and agriculture with time and seasonal harvest of, of cyclical time being introduced um, and uh, in a more specific datage if you look at 8000 BC um, you have the sacrifice rituals in modern day Syria and uh, the farming site where, of course, it's stacked just with human skulls and obsidian tools and altars. Now, Gebser, in his dating here, says this is significant with the rise of the denaturation of human culture, which is moving from, again, that association of the magical with um, you know, animals and domestication and you're moving into the bronze culture of irrigation, of craftsmanship, of sculpting, and the advent of record keeping, of course, in uh, the Akkadians, and um, metal weaponry rising, which is uh, really the beginning of that craft tradition. And, you know, in craftsmanship, it, it is a denaturing, uh, as earlier was the manipulation of things with ritual. Um, things in nature now, the craftsman changes to the forcing and manipulation of objects by the craftsmen themselves. So, you know, simply invoking ritual for, uh, you know, the divine to bring about a, a, a change in nature, a singularity, if you'd like, uh, uh, now shifts to the craftsman who, in his mastery, uh, and of course, if you look at uh, how Gebser looks at the gods and, and the myths with, you know, each of the deities having a sort of different craftsmanship and, uh, you know, man is to bring about the divine world onto, uh, you know, that sort of dualism between heaven and, and or uh, whatever that uh, myth was uh, of the greater uh, divine or forms and bringing that into earth with the craftsmen. And so, again, this is a gradual removing of the being from the nature of things. And likewise, as we get started with the industrial revolution, with the rise of the machine, is an effacement of the displacement of culture, which destroyed the handicraft tradesmen. And uh, this is, of course, exemplified famously in Heidegger, where you have the idea in his etymology of the poesis, 
or bringing forth the blossom from the butterfly in that cocoon stage to a, a fully matured butterfly. Um, and that difference of, of nature then is the loss of authentic things to uh, the machinic or the enframing, as he would have put it. Uh, Gebser, in a similar way here, is calling this the deculturation process. And Gebser further agrees that we're moving in the use of machines and a precursor to the electric acoustic um, to a deficient mode of the prior structure, replacing the efficient qualitative or vital stage earlier of human culture into a simulation really of technical prowess. Um, and so really the theme of the new of uh, a new mutation and overall chapter is really an ultimatum that we haven't seen with Gebser that sees an apocalyptic vision in the rise of a spiritual new age. And then moving then, he wants to have a discussion on the nature of creativity, where you have concrete examples through poetry, architecture, and sculpture. And then we have a very interesting observation on the muses. And uh, to track this, he of course begins with Homer who you know, has the sing in me muse, the divine sings, you know, through the artist as a sort of conduit. But then when we get to the Australian poet in the 19th century, such as Relka, you then see a, a deferral really of the divine, of, of, of the artist, you know, in their muse, uh, having a sort of access or even being a conduit of the divine in its speech, uh, he is met with silence in the heavens, or Relka is, and showing that, of course, the muse has changed in the role of the poet. And so Gebser begins the role of the muses in the Iliad and Odyssey with these three different characteristics of him. You have the chief, the nomosti, or memory, and the latent memory of history, and the poet invokes muses, the historical sum total of events to the conscious and articulation of the poet's world. And so the muse then is part of that myth and mental tool. And it's used by the mental structure that comes in with the Greek development of the images of the mythical structure. And then you have, of course, with the muses and the vitality uh, and the elements, the, uh, with, of course, with the pre-Socratics with uh, water and life and the nymph in association with creativity. Uh, this goes all the way, if you would like, up to Deleuze with the idea of the flows, uh, flowing and, and creativity. Um, and, and you have a similar way of how he saw the dualism of, of uh, life and death in volume one, where the soul and its association with life and, and water, just as the death pole was of the breathing air in association with the flying death beings. And so Relka and the angel of death, in his imagery, the wing being to the sirens and herpes, and at the end of the mental structure invokes, of course, the muse of death and the association of the life pole that starts with Homer to then the death pole, who, of course, in his muse, he is, or lack of, is terrified to even invoke the muse of the angels and uh, that sort of silence the uh, the angels will no longer respond to him because of course being is turned away from beings as Heidegger would say and so Relka and the angel of the death the winged being the sirens and continuing in the 19th century with poetry such as Holderlin or the French symbolists they of course no longer invoke the muse uh, but when they do, they only do it in an ironic. And so you have the invoking of science or rationality, but the poet no longer surrenders or gives themselves up to, um, you know, being a sort of uh, a conduit, as it were, to um, the divine or its relationship uh, now looks to harness the muse and no longer surrenders itself to creativity uh, but wants to actually control poetry. And this is, uh, I think, very prescient to today's world with regards to uh, 
you know, much of art and of course it's politicization. Uh, I'm not, not going to go into a, is art always political, but nonetheless, uh, I think it reigns true with this idea of, you know, controlling the narrative uh, that the artist makes. And we've seen, you know, plenty of times, especially on uh, social media where an artist will try to just rationally uh, and, and sort of invoke not just scientism, but just uh, an, an intellectual capacity to how, you know, you should take his art in. Um, and, and, you know, it leaves nothing for really a hermeneutic uh, tradition to it. Uh, and, and they're largely just telling you what to do with their uh, creativity. Um, and I think that uh, uh, is, is a very interesting point to make here. Gebser would go further and says that this is a manifestation of the disengagement of consciousness from time. But of course, if you look at Oswald Spangler, he says, you know, Faust has lost his way um, in modernity because uh, infinite space uh, and its account as, you know, the most historical consciousness in history and the muse and its recollection are historically bound by getting rid of the muse. He escapes being bound by a temporal perspectivity and shifts into that integral stage where your being uh, in the muse is, is free of, of space and time and as such historicism. Again, uh, to go back to my last video, if you did not see it, where, uh, you know, instead of celebrating this, perhaps we looked at how um, the uh, Eurocentric, you know, way that Gebser, of course, presents the integral. Uh, this is, of course, all European stuff, really. And this could only have happened with the most historically conscious culture. And Spengler says, of course, something similar, just as all of the great German thinkers who, to some degree, we must, uh, you know, consider that by being able to be conscious of, of where rationality would, would really sit for Gebser, or, uh, you know, understanding the decline of civilizations, as Spangler pointed out to us, that this could perhaps be pivotal to bring about, a, you know, a, a new way or to, you know, advert uh, the decline. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, uh, many people would say that, you know, Spangler would say that that's not actually possible, but I think there is a subtle underlying uh, in him that says, you know, there is a purpose for how we are able to be so historical as uh, spiritually Faustian beings who um, could perhaps overcome such uh, an attitude. And Gebser is saying in modernity, this is arguably the case because poems are no longer of time or history and is no longer imbued to a historical sentiment or the milieus, if you'd like. Um, but Spengler would, of course, say that this is the decline of Faustian being historically conscious. And, um, you know, Gebser says this omega point is a mutation that is space-free, but time-free by not being dominated by a historical time consciousness. Now the poet's process is a cystasis or integration of elements to make a whole. Um, and I think this is certainly the case uh, in hypermodernity where we're, you know, really doing a sort of patchwork of all of these different epochs uh, or epistemes, as Foucault would say, of, uh, you know, different logics and truths and all of the historical knowledge we've gained uh, um, you know, really through archaeology and, and such fields, uh, now we are able to just sort of patch them in. But there's no really full one grand narrative structure as we've seen through uh, post-modernity. Um, and so we're seeing the process of no longer being bound of the mythical, mental, and magical realm, and the integral is one of the spirit. Magical, of course, was described as instincts, mythical the soul and of its imagery the mental is of intellect and from the images of soul or the intellect uh, with its abstractions 
But spirit, of course, is a rational, clear, and concerned with looking objects in space that are visible, but an awareness of the process of thinking itself. Um, this is what he would call a verician of seeing through truth to part it through uh, the spirit. Uh, these are not emotions or irrational in a magical or mythical way. Uh, but they are utterly clear, no longer bounded of divisible, but perceptible of mind through the clarity of thought in all of its integration of all structures. Time is integrated, but used, and the poet uses time and uses history, uh, but is no longer used by history. So there's a really interesting way of looking at how now the muse is, is really the harnessing of history for its clarity as opposed to, you know, being tossed around or, or being trapped in the platonic cave, if you'd like, uh, where history is sort of just using you as a sort of muse itself. Uh, we are now the masters of, of the muse. Now, of course, Gebser says this is a part of the new age and quite eagerly celebrates such a condition, but Let's not forget, though, that if, and as we've seen, I think, uh, in our culture, if the poet can no longer remember history and is ultimately faceless, then the poet is disconnected from the muse uh, and can no longer recollect the data or historical consciousness um, uh, uh, in the realm of history, in this historyless or Fukuyama end of history world. Uh, and so now we are eager to forget the past, uh, such as Baudrillard would talk about Holocaust denial, and certainly you would see in other pictorial um, historical events where you know there there's a, a sort of volition towards denying that this historical event could happen, which would not have been perhaps even possible before, uh, and so. Essentially, we're forgetting history uh, as we become a part of this ahistorical, postmodern, um, and, and, and really end of being historical. And then uh, to really finish on Gebser, I wanted to just cover the chapter on the new concepts, which is of the fourth dimension or temporix, which is really encapsulates the anxiety of time which is the theme of the temporal and integration of time in the aperspectival structure. As humans, the subtle changes of the body, but also happens in the shift of the Egyptian art and uh, as such with you know the cranium not being visible until you get to the uh, fourth Greek uh, you know, before Christ century where the mental structure begins, the forehead rises into the view and the scalp recedes. So it's interesting to see how, you know, in his tracing of Egyptian art, the cranium over time, as you develop into the mental stage, becomes more uh, into view, into light. Uh, and so if you look at the magical and mythical, they're always covered by headgear, such as the pharaoh. The forehead is an unconscious change where the mental structure comes into being. So not all of these are just sort of directives of... Um, you know, high elites in their symbolism and a sort of Machiavellian way, if you would like, of, of you know, implicitly understanding we must do this to uh, accentuate uh, such a mentality or such a structure. Um, it, it's much more in a sort of unconscious way as uh, Gebser draws uh, from um, the arts here. Um, but... The mental structure is found again uh, in, in the Renaissance period with the Byzantine art. The Christ child is of the left, the heart side, or the less conscious side. And by the images of Raphael's Madonna, the Christ child goes to the right side. And so the infant on Mary's lap is a subtle change of the rediscovery of the mental and the shift from left to right. So that's a very interesting point he makes here, observation of seeing where the Christ uh, child goes from the left and then in Raphael's instantiation uh, 
uh, goes to the right as a nod towards the rediscovery of the mental structure. And continuing then, the 19th century innovation of the fourth dimension would the start of uh, Carl uh, Friedrich Gauss's anticipation of the non-Euclidean geometry and over the course of that century discovering you know non-Euclidean geometry mathematics which preceded the perspectival painting by a few decades so again there's you know these uh, happenings in history if you'd like are interwoven in their findings um, non-Euclidean space is of course curved and so in the topological surfaces and prior to non-Euclidean geometry, the sum total of the three angles of any triangle should, of course, add up to 180 until Gauss puts the triangle on a curved surface and changes to where it no longer adds up to 180 degrees. Where you see in his example of Cezanne's painting on objects onto curved space, and begins distortions of those objects and you know you're seeing the falling apart of perspectivity and then of course with Einstein's theory which gets to the notion of us being subject to curved space and gravity and light travels the uh, geodesics or along a geodesic line and follows into a curvature and then you have with Hawking with the ultimate conception of the cosmos, the giant sphere that expands from an initial singularity like a giant inflating sphere. Uh, and then you see with the retrieval of the cosmic sphere of the entire universe just as the end of the Greek civilization as being encased inside of a series of celestial spheres and our cosmology of the giant sphere of the universe and what is beyond the sphere and what is expanding uh, it ultimately as a sort of unknowing uh, in our own cosmology. <clears throat> but nonetheless, this foundation is now the primary image of the sphere and the integral structure and puts back all of the perspectival points of view that the mental had carved and to complete the sphere into one uh, carved uh, aperture. And of course, in Platonic thought, the, uh, the, the preference of repetition being as always is, or the ideas, if you'd like, the forms. Um, and so you have the ritual of the stopping of time. The ideal republic would stop history, of course, and the flattening of the exteriors to happen since to reenact the historical singularity of that practice made present in that moment, creating an iconic image or compression of complex processes. So again, in those uh, you know, mythical rituals, you are reenacting what was timeless uh, through the ritual um, and, and really undoing the historical processes. Um, where with the infinite spatial world or Faustian civilization, the perspectival or late rationalistic phase is the integration of a third dimension. And then of course the integral is the fourth dimension and you have time as motion through the hypersphere. And then really after World War II, the integral structure could perhaps be seen as uh, 